They say that real life is often funnier than fiction. Let me tell you a true story about a family that decided to take a day trip to visit their local aquarium. They entered the aquarium and were fascinated by the many displays. However, about midway through their visit, the young parents suddenly discovered that their four-year-old son was missing. He had been with them one moment, and then in the next he was gone. They began to panic, as you can imagine. When they could not find him on their own, they sought the help of a security guard who immediately had all the exits of the aquarium closed until the child was found. The child, let's call him Timmy, was finally located inside the penguin exhibit. Somehow, Timmy had gotten himself over a barrier and was actually in the pen with the penguins. He was fine, however, and his distraught parents were, of course, overjoyed to see him. They finished their tour, got in the family car to make the two-hour trip home. After a while on the road, Timmy's parents noticed that he was acting oddly. He was not uttering a word, and he was staring ahead with a strange expression on his face. Had this experience caused him some kind of trauma? Dad pulled the car over to the side of the road, and both Mom and Dad turned to face Timmy. Tell us, son, they asked calmly. Are you all right? Timmy nodded his head, but still did not say a word. Then they noticed something peculiar. Timmy kept glancing at his little backpack, the one he wore everywhere he went, including inside the aquarium that day. Mom reached over the seat and retrieved the backpack. She unzipped it, and inside the backpack was, are you ready for this, a live baby penguin. Their precocious four-year-old boy had taken a penguin from the aquarium. Don't worry, the baby penguin seemed unharmed. So Timmy's dad, of course, turned quickly the car around and headed back to the aquarium. So can't you see it now as they approached the gates? We were here today. Remember us? We caused you to lock all the doors because we thought our son was missing. Well, here's the penguin that he stole from your display. So that's what they say. Real life is funnier than fiction. Someone once compared penguins to the church of Jesus Christ. You may remember the highly successful documentary movie, The March of the Penguins. It was filmed in Antarctica and tells the amazing story of the Emperor Penguin. Now, according to the film, the female Emperor Penguin gestates only one egg per year. They do not build a nest for that egg but rather incubated in the folds of their skin. For some reason, the emperor penguin lays its single egg during the coldest time of the year, when temperatures drop to as low as minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and in winds that reach velocities of up to 112 miles an hour. Once the female produces the egg, she gives the egg to the male to protect and preserve until she returns from gathering food in the warmer waters of the sea. She will be gone for about nine weeks. And it is in the face of this kind of adversity that the male penguins are entrusted to preserve the egg and must incubate and nurture it in the folds of their skin. They are unable to eat during this whole period and lose almost half of their body weight. In order to preserve this egg and maintain their own body heat, the male emperors huddle together in tight bunches for warmth and protection against the cold and the bitter wind. The entire flock moves as one, huddles as one, stays together as one in order to preserve those eggs. They strive together for one goal, to stay warm in order to produce offspring. And the bitter and brutal winter of Antarctica does not deter them from their goal. 
This singleness of purpose and cooperative spirit provides us with a model for the people of God. We've been given a task, and we accomplish that task by banding together as one body, the body of Christ. St. Paul tells us in our second reading this afternoon that we are a chosen people. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blemish before him. That's an amazing thought, that we have been chosen even before the beginning of the world. Listen again to more more of St. Paul's words when he says, In Christ you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and have believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. In other words, having heard the word of God and embraced it, we have been chosen and missioned. I don't know about you, but it makes me nervous when somebody says that we are God's chosen ones. Consider these words from elsewhere in the book of the prophet Isaiah, or rather the prophet Amos, from which tonight's first reading is taken. Amos says, Of all the people of the earth, I, God says, have chosen you alone. That is why I must punish you the more for all your sins. Is that why we want to be chosen, so we can be punished more for our sins? I don't think so. It's a sobering thing to be chosen by God. The people of Israel were chosen by God, the first chosen people. At best, it was a mixed blessing. A little story about Golda Meir, the prime minister of Israel a long time ago. She once claimed to be disappointed with her heritage. She said, let me tell you the one thing I have against Moses. He took us 40 years into the desert in order to bring us to the one place in the Middle East that has no oil. (laughs) She was being facetious, of course, but it is also true that being a chosen people is not something the Jewish people always relished. It's a sobering thing to be chosen by God. It's not a call to privilege, but a call to purpose. It's not a call to a life of ease, but a call to a life of service. God has indeed chosen us, but it's not a thing to be taken lightly. St. Paul says this is what it means to be chosen, to be holy and blameless in God's sight. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he chose us to be holy and blameless. What does that mean? It means living a life of personal integrity. Living a holy and blameless life doesn't mean we're perfect, but it does mean by God's grace that we're striving to be persons of character and integrity. In the second place, we are chosen to live as God's children. Paul says, in love, God destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ. In love, God destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ. Those are words of encouragement. We were chosen in love to be his adopted children. When children find out that they were adopted, they come to know that they were truly desired by their parents who chose them after all. God went to the ultimate expense to choose us. He gave his son so that he might adopt us. Besides living holy and blameless lives, we are to live caring lives reflecting God's love for all of us. Remember those penguins huddling together to protect those unhatched eggs? Finally, we're chosen to bring God praise. St. Paul says, In him we were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit to the praise of his glory. Praise is our witness to the world out there that God rules our lives And for this reason, praise is not an option for us. It's an obligation. There are many people in our church roles 
whom we will never see here unless their daughter gets married or someone in the family has a funeral. They don't believe that the regular worship, regular worship of God is important. They don't see this as a critical responsibility as we see it. They're wrong. Praise is our witness to the world that God reigns in our lives. We gather each week in this holy place to say to the world, God is alive and God matters to me. That's why I come here week after week. So what does it mean to be chosen? It means to live a life of integrity. It means to love other people as Christ taught us. It means that weekly we gather and let our hearts be filled with his praise. We're chosen not for privilege, but for service. If we look at the picture of the disciples given in this evening's gospel, we can well wonder how on earth Jesus ever had the courage to choose those 12 and send them out on mission. Each time Jesus reminded them that he was going to his death, they either tried to dissuade him or they failed completely to understand and empathize with him. They were bumbling time after time in their following of the gospel. They were more concerned about who was the greatest among them, remember? About who was going to sit at his right or his left. Later they would betray him and most all of them would abandon him in the end. Yet he chose them and entrusted them with an integral mission to the world, to the rest of the world. And it's our mission to the world too. So like the emperor penguin, mission is critical to our identity as Christians. The disciples go out as representatives of the larger community of which they were part. We go out as representatives of the church and we find the strength to do what needs to be done in the name of Christ. God bless you.